three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 439. Welcome in. I am very excited. Dude, life is good right now. I'm doing really well. My dad and my stepmom are in town visiting, and oh my gosh, it is so great. Like, it's the first time I've seen them in six months, and it's cool to show them around where I live and my neighborhood and take them to the beach, and uh, I, we're really close, and I didn't realize how much I was missing them until seeing them, and I uh, it's just been such a fun week seeing them, being around them, and really having an amazing, amazing time. Let's jump in. Uh, we'll talk briefly about Monday Night Football. On Monday Night Football, the Pittsburgh Steelers beat the Cleveland Browns 26-14. to I'm not going to lie, as an objective third party here that isn't a Browns fan or a Steelers fan, it wasn't a very interesting game. I, I feel bad. It wasn't a horrible game or anything. Like, there's been way worse football games this year, even on Monday Night Football especially, Uh, But the Browns are already eliminated from the playoffs going into the game, and Pittsburgh led basically the entire time. The first quarter wasn't very offensively interesting, and then Pittsburgh got a lead, and they led the whole way after that. And uh, really the big headline was that it was Big Ben's final home game in Pittsburgh, and it was awesome. He won. I was really glad to see that. I can't imagine that moment with him losing would have been really sad and awkward and not like a fitting end to what it was, and... The whole game felt like a retirement party for Ben Roethlisberger, if I'm being honest. And I want to, as I look back on Big Ben's career, by far my favorite Big Ben moment was his touchdown pass to Santonio Holmes in the Super Bowl against Arizona, where he threw this crazy ball on, you know, right on the goal line, it, high and outside. Santonio Holmes stretches out to catch it and just, oh man. Uh, and if anyone hasn't seen that, I believe John Madden made the call, too. So go look up uh, Santonio Holmes, Big Ben, touchdown, Super Bowl, Arizona, something with those keywords in it on YouTube. You'll find it. And uh, again, it's one of my, uh, for, as far as a, uh, both a great throw and a great catch, it's one of the best great passes and catches in NFL history, in my opinion. And uh, I love, love, love thinking about and looking back on that moment. Now, there are two more cool little notes I want to talk about from this football game. Number one. The Browns made a really cool defensive play where the Steelers had the ball on fourth and five and Cleveland had a linebacker blitz and Big Ben goes, oh, linebacker blitzing. Let me find my tight end, replace the blitz with a throw. I say that all the time. If they're blitzing, you like it because there's fewer people in coverage and you go, "Okay, hey, if they're blitzing, I can find I can replace the blitz with the ball. Big Ben did all that. And Cleveland got him because what they did was drop a defensive lineman, Malik McDowell, into coverage. So one guy goes up, one guy goes back. It was unexpected. It got me. It got Big Ben. It was a really, really lovely defensive play call. And they executed it really well. Malik McDowell actually knocked the ball down to the ground on fourth and five. I mean, you can call the right play there. You make that call. Hey, we're going to bring a blitzer. We're going to have the line. You know, the defensive lineman's going to drop into coverage. But you still got to execute it. He still got to cover the pass and knock the ball down. He did that. It was a wonderfully executed, you know, little bit of trickery by the Browns defense. I love that moment. One of my favorite plays of the game. Like that, looking back, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Now, number two, TJ Watt, the Steelers defensive end, really more of an edge rusher, kind of an outside linebacker. He had four sacks in this football game. He leads the NFL with 21 and a half sacks. And by the way, he also led the league in sacks last year. He was on a tear. Uh, Now, we got to talk about, we need to talk about the Browns quarterback, Baker Mayfield. On Monday Night Football, uh, and this is something ugly, but we got to start with it. We have to address it and talk about it because there's no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to go around it. On Monday, Baker Mayfield was sacked nine times by the Pittsburgh defense. And Baker did not play well, but the Browns game plan to block T.J. Watt, the stud outside pass rusher, you know, edge rusher from the Steelers, TJ Watt. The plan to block TJ Watt was terrible. It wasn't good. And, you know, they put him one-on-one with a backup rookie right tackle, James Hudson. He got beat all night. It put a lot of pressure on Baker, clearly got a lot of sacks for TJ Watt. And that's a bad plan. Again, 
There's no way around that. You have to acknowledge, hey, I think the Browns coaching staff can do better there than putting one of the best pass rushers in the entire NFL one-on-one with a rookie who is a backup, right? That's not a good plan. However, Baker chose to talk about it after the game. And the way he said it came across as him calling out his team and calling out the coaching staff in Cleveland. And there's no need for that. You know, I really think it's a bad idea. In my One of my favorite movies is King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. He's got a great line. He says, why make enemies when you can have friends? Why make an enemy there? Like the last thing you want is an antagonistic relationship with your coaching staff where they feel slighted and called out. Everybody saw what happened. Everybody saw Baker Mayfield getting taken to task and having a bad game. Sure, I think he had like 10 incompletions in a row at one point, but also getting sacked a bunch. And clearly the broadcasters were talking about it. Everybody saw it on Twitter. Everyone's talking everywhere. Hey, why are they leaving TJ Watt one-on-one with a rookie right tackle? That's a bad idea. Baker doesn't need to talk about that. The media knows it. He knows it. What it felt like to me was Baker's... Maybe immaturity is the word, his desire to get the last word and feeling a need to defend himself when like, hey, everyone's got your back here. Everyone knows that's a bad game plan. I just felt like that was uncalled for and and maybe a sign of a a, a coming separation between the Cleveland Browns and their quarterback, Baker Mayfield. And I want to be very clear here about this because without emotion, I'm not riled up or angry, but the Browns must move on from their quarterback, Baker Mayfield. They got to trade him or release him, get rid of him. He's, he can't be their quarterback next year. He had a bad year. He's had a lot of bad games. In fact, the Packers game is by far the worst game of the year he had, and it was kind of emblematic of what he's had, what's gone on all year, which is that <laughs> Baker Mayfield had four interceptions against the Green Bay Packers last week, and his team lost to a really good Packers team by two points. If that is an evidence right there of that this is a really good Browns roster ready to win that's being held back by their quarterback, there is no other example. That's the one that you're like, you can't explain that. That's Baker. And all year I felt like he's holding his team back and they're not getting what they need from him. Baker's been inaccurate. He's made bad decisions. And the reality is Baker was given advantages that most quarterbacks have never gotten in their entire career. He had Odell Beckham Jr. Now, he couldn't make that work. I say had because the relationship was not well nurtured by Baker, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, Odell was unhappy and they had to get rid of him. And that's that's a big loss. I I don't know. That, to me, that says something about Baker, that he couldn't get on the same page as Odell and, you know, keep Odell happy. Then the other people Baker's played with on offense this year, Jarvis Landry, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, Austin Hooper, Harrison Bryant. That's an all-star cast. That's a lot of talent that most quarterbacks would die to have. On top of that, they got a pretty good offensive line. Jedrick Wills, Joel Benantonio, J.C. Treader, Wyatt Teller, Jack Conk on the right tackle. He's out right now, but, you know, and even though they've had injuries on the offensive line, that's a good O-line when they're fully healthy, and most quarterbacks don't get that. Baker was given everything a young quarterback could dream of having. Again, a good offensive line, a good running game, good receivers, some playmakers on defense, What does Tua have in Miami? No running game, one receiver, a terrible offensive line. How about uh, Zach Wilson in New York? Or Daniel Jones, the other quarterback in New York, the Giants quarterback. Daniel Jones has never played on a roster as as good as what Baker has had this year in Cleveland. Baker was given everything, but the fact is he played badly. What if Cleveland had Matt Ryan or Derek Carr at quarterback instead. Do you remember the last time Matt Ryan got a lot of help? He went to a Super Bowl, had a 28-3 lead, and won the NFL MVP. Certainly that's better than what Baker's done this year. How about Derek Carr? Derek Carr has never been on a team in his NFL career as talented as what Baker has right now in Cleveland. And by the way, this year the Raiders have been a mess. Coach got fired. People got released, you know, losing his top, you know, one of his top receivers, losing draft picks, all kinds of stuff. You know, I mean, former first round picks, excuse me. All kinds of stuff have, have gone on for the Raiders. And by the way, their team isn't actually that talented. And yet still, Derek Carr has his team one game from a playoff appearance. If they win on Sunday and beat LA, they're in. 
I don't think they're going to do that. I think the Raiders are going to miss the playoffs. But the fact that they're even in striking distance is amazing. And Baker couldn't even get his team in striking distance. Jalen Hurts, the Eagles quarterback, is in the playoffs this year with a way worse roster in Philadelphia. I say this without emotion. I say this without anger or frustration. To me, it's a fact. Baker has to go. And the number one reason to me why Baker has to go is that I believe Cleveland can win more games without him. There's a better quarterback out there that can help them win. Matt Ryan, Gardner Minshew, Derek Carr. Like, I don't think Derek Carr is available, but let's be clear. Derek Carr would do really well in Cleveland. And the other sad thing is if Baker doesn't stay in Cleveland, I don't know where he can go and do better. Washington? Like, that's the problem with having a really good football team is that if you can't win with a roster in Cleveland, the really good receivers they have, the good offensive line, the good defense. Like, everyone was talking going into the year, myself, but if you weren't say like, <laughs> I know that I had really high expectations for Cleveland. They were a really good roster. But it wasn't just me. Everyone around the league went, hey, it's weird, but Cleveland, it's, it's weird to say this because the Browns have been historically really bad, but everyone looked at Cleveland during the preseason and said, yo, that's a really good roster. Like, that's a lot of really, really good players. And if Baker goes to another team, he's not going to find that. Washington, um, New Orleans, who else could need a new quarterback? Pittsburgh, um, maybe in Denver, but I, that's the that my my point is that if you couldn't win in Cleveland, like how are you going to make it worse? How, how are you going to make it work on a worse football team? I don't I don't know. That's hard for me to imagine. And the one thing people say to defend Baker is that oh he's hurt. He's got a torn labrum in his non throwing left shoulder. Remember he throws right handed. His left shoulder is injured. And I want to be clear about this because I, I you know, <laughs> Baker's season he had this year, the really bad year, really, really hurt his career. It lost him a lot of money, in my opinion. And if Baker's injury is why he's been playing bad this year, then he should have got surgery like 10 weeks ago. But to me, it doesn't make sense because a shoulder injury isn't the thing that's making bad decisions, isn't what's forcing the ball into double coverage or making bad throws or passing up open receivers to throw it. The interception against Pittsburgh on Monday, his first one, <laughs> he's got a, a route wide open underneath and instead forces it into coverage. He gets picked off. I'm like, that's a bad decision. This shoulder had nothing to do with that. He's been inaccurate. And I can't imagine trying to throw a football with a torn labrum. But if the reason why... Baker's been bad is because of the shoulder, then he shouldn't have played with the bad shoulder. That's a decision that someone made that was wrong. Because all Baker did this year, in my opinion, over and over and over again, was hurt his football team. The team in Cleveland is ready to win. They need to find a quarterback who can help them do that. They need to find a quarterback for next year who can help them win games because the Browns are far too good of a roster to not be winning football games. Cleveland and Denver, they're the two teams right now. Denver needs a coach and a quarterback. Cleveland needs a quarterback. But those are the two rosters right now in the NFL that are way too talented and far too good to not be winning in the NFL. The Browns have to move on from Baker Mayfield. Uh, by the way, I saw something I want to talk about. I don't have much to say here, but, and it's, it is old news, but I want to acknowledge it, talk about it, and give it some praise Cowboys defensive coordinator Rob, uh, sorry, Robert Quinn. Robert Quinn is a player. Uh, Cowboys defensive coordinator Dan Quinn declined to be interviewed as the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. He said, I'm good. Don't want the interview. Don't want the job. And I love that because it's Dan Quinn recognizing he's got a good thing going in Dallas. There's no reason for him to leave. He can run the defense. He's got full autonomy there. And he, last time he was head coach, it didn't work out very well. I, I don't. Dan Quinn better find a really, really good opportunity for him to leave what he's got going on in Dallas. They're winning. Everything's good. He's happy. He's got a lot of job security. And uh, I really thought that 
what Dan Quinn did when that came out, that, that acknowledgement is him saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my time. I'm in no hurry. And often you see head coaches rush off into the next job and, frankly, leave a good opportunity for a bad one. There's a lot of times I'm like, hey, if you're, if you're winning, why, why are you leaving? Uh, for example, uh, Byron Leftwich, the Buccaneers offensive coordinator, just won a Super Bowl. He's coaching Tom Brady. And whenever he's done, like whenever Tom Brady retires, he's going to still have opportunities to be a head coach. But I, if I'm Byron Leftwich, I'm going to play out. I'm going to like let this fully play out. I'm going to see everything I can do with Tom Brady, soak up all the information I can, gain all the stories and all the knowledge I can so that when Tom Brady is done, he can be done and go find a head coaching job. But there's always going to be head coaching jobs. Don't leave a good situation for one that isn't necessarily very good. And uh, I, I like the the restraint, maybe is the right word, the restraint by Dan Quinn, the Cowboys defensive coordinator, to not just rush off into the first job that is uh, talked about with him. Instead, he's like, ah, I'm good. I don't even want that. He didn't even interview, which is uh, really, really impressive and very wise, in my opinion, from Dan Quinn. All right, let me drink some water. And then we'll shift into my favorite part of the show. It is time for Ask Zach. My favorite part of the show is where I answer questions from the audience. In case you do not know how it works, you go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Shomler. You give a dollar a month. You can give more if you want to. Please do. It literally helps pay my rent. But a dollar a month gives you access to submit questions on Patreon. Now, if you submit a question on Patreon, I do not guarantee to read your question on the show. My only guarantee is I pick the top couple and read them at the end of the show. Now, today's question, the first one today, is from Dominic. Now, I am dumb. Well, let's be clear. I always start Ask Zach before I open my notes to read the question. So, do, 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 Okay, here we go. Dominic's question. <laughs> Sorry, if that was terrible, I apologize. Uh, Dominic, elevator music is not my strong suit. I have just learned. Dominic says, hey, Zach, how have you been doing? I was just wondering your thoughts on Cam Rising, the Utah quarterback. He reminds me of Gardner Minshew, not just because of the mustache and the hair. Hope you have a great 2020. No, I thought that too, watching the Rose Bowl. I'm like, this Cam Rising kid has the same energy as Gardner. It's that it's the swagger. It's the carefree nature. Yeah, he's kind of, you know, he's, he's from California, but it's got that southern nature, the old truck and the fun. But Cam Rising, to me, it was his poise and the leadership, but his clear, clearly he's comfortable with who he is. And that's exactly what Gardner Minshew is. He's a guy who's a good leader who can play ball and is very, very comfortable with who he is and leans into his personality. And uh, that's what makes Cam Rising awesome, in my opinion, as well. And by the way, Cam Rising... On my radar, looks like a, a future NFL quarterback. And uh, I, I think I said when I covered the Rose Bowl, man, he's the quarterback I've been waiting for Utah to have because Utah every year plays really physical, good defense. They run the ball well. They, you know, I, they're just needing an NFL level quarterback. And Cam Rising might be that guy. So Cam Rising is one of my most anticipated quarterbacks to watch next year in college football. Jeffrey writes and says, Joe Burrow is officially a top 10. NFL quarterback in my eyes. His pocket presence and decision-making is top five in the league already at just his second year in. And he does everything he can control so well. I'm going to say that again. He does everything he can control so well. I totally agree with that. That franchise guy made the comparison that he's Tom Brady from the waist up and Aaron Rodgers from the waist down, and it's spot on for me. Let me know your thoughts on this. Hope all is well. Top 10, I would say top five. Uh, you know, I, I think Joe. I think Joe Burrow is a top five quarterback, and to me, when you think about his decision making, his accuracy, the ways he's making defenses wrong, meaning that you can play great coverage, and Joe Burrow's still going to throw a back shoulder fade into tight coverage and and throw his receiver open. Like when you're throwing people open, when a de defender, uh, when a corner has great coverage and the receiver isn't open by most NFL standards, and yet you're throwing it behind a defender's ear into a tight window, turning the receiver around for a touchdown like he does with Jamar Chase over and over again. That's when you go from really good to deserving to be in the same conversation as Aaron Rodgers, as Patrick Mahomes. And by the way, the thing that is not getting talked about with Joe Burrow is that 
the offensive line still needs work in Cincinnati. Like, there's a lot of pressure on Joe Burrow, and he is making people miss. He's avoiding sacks. He's stepping up in the pocket, moving around a lot in, like, a little short, you know, tight radius and making defenders miss and throwing the ball downfield and stepping into hits and getting hit as he throws. And he's dealing, man. Joe Burrow, to me, is a top-five quarterback, and he's in the conversation right now with Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers as a guy who is at the top of the league absolutely in the quarterback at the quarterback position. Okay, Joe writes in. Let me drink some more water real quick. Joe says, hey, Zach, happy new year. Can we talk about Trevor Lawrence? I know he's in a bad situation in Jacksonville, but I've not even seen any signs of greatness from him. I didn't expect them to have a great record at the end of the year, but I did hope to see maybe just one statement type game from him. Gardner Minshew had a better rookie season with Jacksonville. Joe, I totally agree. I'm worried. I am worried. Uh, Going into the year, I said that it's a disadvantage for Trevor Lawrence that he's never lost in his career. In high school, in college, he never had a bad year, never losing season. That's going to really hurt him because when you're not winning, you have to learn how to handle that emotionally and how to... What what do I fix? And, and unfortunately, I think that he learned a bad thing this year, which is that the story Trevor Lawrence is probably going to tell himself is that, hey, we, we lost because our head coach, Urban Meyer, was a bad head coach. And it'll be easy to not focus on the things that he needs to do better as a player. And I think that's really unhelpful. I, I hope he doesn't tell himself that story because to put all the blame on Urban Meyer would be massively unhelpful and a big hindrance to him. And... It's easy to blame people, but what he needs to do is look inward. There's a lot of little things Trevor Lawrence can improve. And and the other really big concern I have is that I don't see any fire from Trevor Lawrence, meaning like that whatever that means, I'm I'm still trying to quantify that because that's not really – you can't – the fire, what does that mean? Well, when I watch Justin Herbert, you see some stuff you're like, hey, hey, this dude's a baller. Like he is – he's fighting hard and – Joe Burrow, uh, there's fight, there's energy, and you know, Gardner Minshew was straight up a better quarterback and a better leader in his first and second year in Jacksonville. And Trevor Lawrence has not been awful, but not been like there's not been like this bright spot I've been hoping to see. And um, I think it's fair to say that it is concerning and. Some of the other quarterbacks drafted in the first round. Davis Mills has looked better than Trevor Lawrence. Davis Mills, a third-round pick, has looked better <laughs> better than Trevor Lawrence. And the Texans aren't a good football team. It's not like, oh, well, Davis Mills has way more help. No, it's just that Trevor hasn't been that impressive. And it's early. It's not fair to give up on the guy. I'm certainly, that's not what I'm saying here or not my message at all. But it is, you're justified if you're worried about Trevor Lawrence because I am and I think it makes a lot of sense. But we'll see how next year goes. It's very early. I'm not in any hurry to discard the guy and move on. But um, if anything, the concerns I had going into this year, I still have. And that in of itself is a worry to me. Okay, next question is, from Richmond. It's a long one. Richmond says, do you think that the New Year's Six Bowl games should be removed from being college football playoff semifinal games? Sorry about the wording. Not sure how to word that properly, he says. With the current agreement, two of the New Year's Six Bowls serve as the semifinal games with three with a three-year rotation, thus removing the guaranteed bids from the equation. For example, uh, I remember watch, once watching Oklahoma and Georgia play in the Rose Bowl, even though the Rose Bowl normally is played between the Pac-12 champion and the Big Ten champion. While people may not care about the Fiesta, Cotton, and Peach Bowls being affected due to none of those having a guaranteed bid for a conference champion, this has a pretty big impact on the Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and Orange Bowl. From what I observe, these bowls are still very popular due to the nature of the guaranteed bids, and it would seem that people still love the idea of conference champions playing against each other in these bowls, an opportunity we completely lose the chance to see when one of these bowl games is a semifinal game. Of course, as long as the college football playoff exists, there is still a chance we get a conference champion 
versus a team that didn't even play in the conference championship, cough, cough, Sugar Bowl. But this at least resembles the tradition of the bowl games that are so highly regarded among fans. And he's referencing Baylor playing Ole Miss. Imagine if the Rose Bowl was a semifinal game this year. Sure, another bowl game can fill the role, but I'd, I'd imagine even if another bowl game managed to secure Utah and Ohio State, both of them, it wouldn't feel the same to the fans of each school. Okay, a lot there. It's very long. But Richmond, at minimum, I think you should take the Rose Bowl out of the rotation. I think the Rose Bowl is actually better off without the college football playoff. It doesn't need the cachet, the name, and the attention that the CFP will bring it. And semifinal games are usually bad. I don't think you want to ruin the Rose Bowl. It doesn't, it doesn't need the attention. It's already good enough on its own. I think of Oregon, DeAnthony Thomas against Russell Wilson in Wisconsin. USC, Sam Darnold at Penn State, you know, having a crazy ending. And this year, Utah, Ohio State. The Rose Bowl does not need the college football playoff to get people to watch it at all. And if anything, it hurts it. So, yeah, I, I, the Rose Bowl is the number one game to me that I want to rescue. But that's also partially because it's my favorite bowl game. But I, I hear you. And, uh, I, yeah, I think le- the, game, the bowl games that have tradition and history – there's no need to give them to the college football playoff because all it really does is cheapen them a little bit, actually, in my opinion. And I don't know why we need to shoehorn existing bowl games into the college football playoff. Okay, Griffin wants me to talk about Mike Zimmer and uh, the Vikings. So Griffin writes in. He says, Hey, Zach, why do you think Kellen Mond didn't start on Sunday Night Football? I saw your video before the year saying you believed in him. Thanks. So uh, Kirk Cousins, the Vikings quarterback, did not play on Sunday night against Green Bay. They started Sean Mannion at quarterback instead. Uh, And in my opinion, the way that Mike Zimmer, the Vikings coach, who I, I don't think will be the Vikings coach for much longer, the way he handled this situation was idiotic in my mind. He's not an idiot. He's a good coach, but I don't think, I think he totally mishandled what happened here. What did Minnesota gain by playing Sean Mannion at quarterback? They got blown out. It was not a good game. And from an evaluation standpoint, like, what is there to benefit from Sean Mannion? What really needed to happen was Minnesota needed to put Kellen Mond into a game and evaluate how good he is and what he can do. And Zimmer, after the game, called out Kellen Mond. They're like, well, is there any consideration to maybe put Kellen Mond into the game? And and why? And Mike Zimmer was like, no, I see him every day. Why would I want to see him in the game? It's like, geez, that is, first of all, really harsh and, and uncalled for, but also very short-sighted. And I think you can learn, I just, I don't know. I don't think practice is the best way to evaluate. It's pretty good. You see the guy every day, that's great. But how about you see what Kellen Mond can do in a game? Because if nothing else, if you're going to get blown out anyway with Sean Mannion, who there is no future with Sean Mannion. He's not going to be your future franchise quarterback. Let's see what the young guy can do. And it's another example of Mike Zimmer totally mishandling an offensive situation and just being very conservative and weird from a, an offensive standpoint. Raphael writes in and says, Hey, Zach, what's your opinion on resting starters before a playoff run? What teams or players would benefit from resting? Any teams that should avoid doing so? There are many interesting situations in the NFC this year. So someone also wrote in about this with the Bengals. Um, So if you rest your starters, you risk losing momentum, right? If if you're not playing, you are losing an opportunity to fine tune some stuff and get ready for the playoffs. That's one thing. But also you don't want people to get hurt. I mean, what if you'd secured a playoff spot? And then you play your quarterback in the final week of the year and he gets hurt and he misses the entire playoff run. Like, hey, that's you're going to get destroyed for that. So my, my philosophy is to do what I think most people should do, which is echo anything Bill Belichick does. Bill Belichick, the Patriots head coach, won not one, not two, not three, not even five, but six Super Bowls. I'm like, hey. And, and by the way, he also won another one, a seventh one, as a defensive coordinator with the New York Giants. He's not a dummy. Bill Belichick is a really good coach. He's won a lot in the NFL. His philosophy is every game is an opportunity to get better. 
we're not sitting out. And the minute you stop thinking about every game as a chance to fine tune and reflect and learn and grow as a football team, that is when you lose ultimately in the long run. And uh, so I, I'd, I'd play my players, man. I'm like, hey, if we get our butts kicked, it's going to be good because we're going to get film that is going to teach us a lot. And if we win, we get momentum and you keep building and it's an opportunity to grow and fine tune what you're doing. So I would very much hesitate to rest my starters. But if you have a guy like Ronk who if you if someone banged up, probably don't play them. But if you can play, I want you to play. And uh, I don't know. That's I just I really think you should listen to and defer to Bill Belichick if you're not sure. And I really respect Bill. He's won a lot. Clearly, he knows what he's doing. And I, I think I would follow his lead there with that. Ultimate A wrote in with a long one. He said, Zach, two things. Number one, I am infuriated by the coaching decisions by Zach Taylor in the end of the Bengals game against KC this week. I'm not a Bengals fan, but I was listening to the game on the radio while on the road and found myself yelling at Zach for being an idiot. Why do you risk the health of your star quarterback for future playoff games on a fourth and inches from the goal line and not just kick a field goal for the lead? It's poor coaching to go for the touchdown there instead of kicking a field goal because it makes it more likely that your players get hurt. The radio announcers for the game kept talking about how they disagreed with the decision and describing the bruises Burrow already had sustained on his arm and hand. And on top of it, Burrow gets injured on a play that didn't count on the final series as well. Credit to Taylor for getting his team back into the game, but this is inexcusable. If I were GM, I'd give him a piece of my mind in a bad, bad way. It's rare I truly feel angry at a game, but this grievance I needed to get off my chest. The second thing is, is Patrick Mahomes no longer a young quarterback, in quotes, and eventually now a, quote, veteran quarterback, even though he's still on his rookie deal? At what point do rising stars like Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, and Mac Jones no longer get the, quote, rookie treatment and are graduated to, quote, veteran status? Is it when their rookie deals are over? Thanks for the content. Happy New Year. Uh, When you win an NFL MVP... You're no longer a young quarterback. <laughs> if you win an NFL MVP like Lamar Jackson has, like Patrick Mahomes has, to me, you're now a veteran. So that, that's very simple. We don't need to dive into it much more than that. Um, and then ultimate, <clears throat> ultimate A, I actually liked what Zach Taylor did. Um, I would not want to give the ball back to Patrick Mahomes with a minute left unless I have a seven-point lead. I'm not kicking a field goal on the one-yard line with a minute left in the game. I'm going to either get the touchdown, and then my lead is safe because he's either going to tie the game or I win. Or if I don't get it on fourth and inches, then I'm going to make Patrick Mahomes drive 99 yards, which is a heck of a lot farther than if you kick off and it gets down at the 25 or maybe gets returned even farther. A three-point lead is not safe from Patrick Mahomes. Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes. I'm not giving those guys the ball down three points at the end of a game. No way. I want a seven-point lead. It's the only way I feel safe. And the Bengals did not, they were coaching to win, not to lose or have a good showing. It's aggressive. And I I actually really appreciated what Zach Taylor did. And uh, I hear your your grievance, Ultimate A, but I just, I I actually like the philosophy. made a lot of sense to me. And I thought Zach Taylor did the right stuff in that game. Evan writes in and says, Hey, Zach, I've seen comments online regarding Cincinnati's involvement in the CFP. After being beat 27 to 6, some were saying that Ohio State would have put up a better game. I do not think that this would be the case since they barely beat Utah. Do you think Ohio State would have been a better matchup? Is Utah really that good? Is there another team that you would have liked to see? Obviously, the college football playoff needs to be expanded to work better. But I think there is no such a skill gap between two teams in the national championship ga- game and the rest of foot- college football. I, 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 sir, he says, I think there is such a skill gap between the two teams in the national championship game and the rest of college football that it would not have mattered who they played in the semifinals. You're probably not wrong. Georgia and Alabama are head and shoulders better than everybody else. But uh, Ohio State would have put up a better fight than Cincinnati did against Alabama. Um, you know, Alabama didn't even play a very good game. You know, they, they like really didn't run the ball as well as they could have or as much as they could have. They ran it well. Just I thought they, for some reason, kept throwing the ball. And I'm like, why are you? Alabama doesn't, doesn't need to throw the football at all. And it actually, 
I think, stalled a couple of their drives because they kept trying to throw. Also, Ohio State had a bunch of people opt out against Utah. You know, two of their top three receivers didn't play. Their tackle, uh, their defensive tackle, Haskell Garrett, didn't play. I mean, like, so Ohio State would have put up a better game against Georgia, undoubtedly. They're more talented than Cincinnati, and uh, I I think they would have played Georgia better than Michigan did as well. So uh, I, it's a weird question because the playoff committee chooses these four teams with very nebulous and unclear rules. And to me, I'm like, well, can the best four teams play? I don't really care if you win your division or the, like, I thought Ohio state was a better football team than Michigan, even though Michigan beat them. That's controversial, but I don't really care. It's my show. I can say what I want. And at the end of the day, I don't care if Cincinnati's 12 and 0, if they're not the best, one of the best four teams in college football, I don't think they should get in, but um, there's too much politics at play, and I think th the best answer is just expand it, let everybody in, and let's stop these dumb arguments and debates that could be proven on the field if they just let eight teams in. But once eight teams are in, no one better be talking about, well, the number nine team got— Okay, if you're, not, if you're the number nine team in the country, when the number five, six, seven, and eight team probably aren't going to win a national title— I don't want to hear that the number nine team in the country could have won but didn't get a shot. No, no, no. I don't. I don't. If you're ranked tenth in the country, crocodile tears for me. I'm not. I'm not feeling bad for you at all. You could have been. You if you can't make it into the top eight, you have no no opportunity to go and, and try to win a championship. And because um, if that means if you're like if you're like the the number eight ranked team in the country, you didn't win your division, <laughs> and. Um, you're lucky to be there. So I, I'm just like, come on. I, I don't really need to. That's the arguments I don't want to have in the future with people. It's just, look, it, it, the number nine and 10 team did not get screwed over. Let's move on from that. But when you're not letting all five conference winners and I think some of the really good football teams in, like in Ohio State, that's when I go, we could let a couple more teams in and, and really have probably hopefully some better football games as well as – um you know, a lot less confusion and a lack of clarity from the decision makers that, you know, the playoff selection committee. Devin writes in and says, hi, Zach. Me and my friend John were having a discussion about the Steelers passing on Davis Mills in 2021. I'm critical of Pittsburgh when they pass on quarterbacks who turn out to be pretty good in the league like Mills and Minshew, while the Steelers continue to roll with Mason Rudolph and Dwayne Haskins. John brought up how our coaching staff hasn't been developing, hasn't developed a good quarterback since Big Ben. Meanwhile, a quarterback prospect two years straight has gone to Pep Hamilton and turned out to be a star, Davis Mills and Justin Herbert. My question for you is how much of an impact does a quarterback coach have on whether a QB turns out great or not? As always, hope you're doing well and look forward to the next episode, Devin. Yeah, Pep Hamilton is a great offensive, uh, great offensive mind. Very, very good quarterback coach. He made Cardell Jones look good in the XFL, by the way. And Cardell Jones is not a good quarterback. Um, Pep Hamilton, yeah, he, he made Justin Herbert look good as a rookie last year and helped develop him, and he helped develop Davis Mills. Uh, let's think about it this way, Devin. You ask, d does a quarterback coach matter, and how much do they help your quarterback's development? Well, he's the guy who sees the quarterback every single day. The quarterback coach has a massive impact on your your quarterback and how well they do. And um, absolutely, uh, you know, Pep Hamilton is one of the best in the league. And, I, you know, also, just because you're a good quarterback coach doesn't mean you need to be an offensive coordinator or a head coach. Pep Hamilton is good at the job of quarterback coach. It doesn't need to be more. It doesn't need to be promoted beyond that. We, we tend to think, oh, he's a quarterback whisperer. Let's make him a head coach. Why? 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 He's a good court. He's a good quarterback coach. The Peter principle says if you keep promoting someone, eventually they're going to get promoted uh, until they fail. Until you know they can't do that job anymore. And uh, Pep Hamilton is a guy that he should be the most desired quarterback coach in the league. But maybe that's all he is, and that's okay too. Alex writes in and says. Hey, Zach, first of all, hope you are hanging in there. 
Second, I wanted to ask you about whether or not NFL teams should incorporate designed laterals more often. Normally, they are only used at the end of games and are ineffective because the defense is expecting it. However, I feel like teams could have great success if incorporated planned planning. If Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this again. However, I feel like teams could have great success if incorporated planned laterals were used sparingly. For example, I'm imagining Travis Kelsey catching a slant and then immediately tossing it to, uh, to Tyreek Hill, who is running another slant in the opposite direction being deadly. In fact, I tend to remember a play where Kelsey did such a thing, but it did not seem rehearsed. I understand turnovers are a thing, and this is incredibly risky, but I feel like if practiced enough and used sparingly in games, it could be incredibly effective. Let me know your thoughts and how my idea could be tweaked to work. So yeah, like occasionally that could work. Um, it's a trick play, but it's really risky. And I wouldn't want to spend a lot of practice time on it unless it's like, hey, this is a really a, a, a trick play we have designed and planned. Um, but to me, like the short answer, Alex, is that it, it's too risky and I wouldn't want to, I'm not building my offense around something that is inherently a fumble, basically. It's a, you're throwing the ball in the air and hoping the other guy catches it. It's a lot of moving parts, and uh, I'd rather just trust my guys are going to make people miss and not fumble there and beat them with scheme and, and routes and, and throws than laterals. Lateral, I mean, they're, uh, you're not wrong. It's, it's not a bad idea, but the risk is not worth the reward, if that makes sense. Jeff Boyardee writes in. I love that name. <laughs> he says, Hello, Zach. I was a Patreon, uh, Patreon supporter a couple years ago and the, finally am able to rejoin to support and join the conversations for Ask Zach. Jeff Boyardee, welcome back. Awesome to see you. I'm curious how you feel about the battle for the playoff spot between the Raiders and the Chargers. Is there a specific outcome you would prefer for the sake of playoff matchups come wildcard weekend? I personally would love to see either team make it in as a Raiders making the playoffs after a tumultuous year they've had battling through would be really impressive for the team and Rich Basaccia. I do admit, I feel like if the Raiders made the playoffs though, they would be one and done. Whereas the Chargers feel like they have a more likely shot to advance. What say you? Glad to be back as a patron. Thank you for making my days as an Amazon driver more bearable. Hey, well done. You're out there giving people all the stuff they need. Uh, it's it's a, it's a short answer here because you, you're totally right, and you, you already said it, but the Raiders are a cool story, and that's awesome. But L.A. is a better team and has a better chance of winning a playoff game and making a playoff run. And because they're a better team, they're going to have a, probably a better playoff game. It's more competitive and interesting. I don't want to watch Raiders get blown out during Wild Card Weekend. I want to watch L.A., challenge someone and maybe win that's the difference and uh, that is why i would want i want the chargers to win on sunday but again if the raiders win i'm not going to be upset I'm, i'll be happy because that's an amazing story and i think will allow me to justify my praise even further of Derek carr their starting quarterback final question of the day let me drink some water to end this one this would be fun samuel says hi zach i have a football question and a life question I'm not going to answer the football question, just going to answer the life one. He says, starting with the life question, I recently moved from Ohio to Montana for a new job. Do you have any advice from your recent move on good ways to get involved with your new community and meet new people? Okay. Uh, yeah. So you attract people when you love yourself, right? And not in like an unhealthy way, but if you're comfortable with who you are and um, you're confident and just very comfortable who you are, you attract people and people like that. They want to hang out with that guy. And so I would encourage you, go on adventures and it's okay to go alone. I go to the beach alone all the time. I go to bars alone. I read my book. And frankly, when I read my Kindle at a bar, you know what people say to me? They say, what are you reading? What are you doing? What's your, they, they, well, I'm, it's actually interesting because I'm alone at a booth at a bar reading a book and that you would never expect brings a lot of attention because people want to ask about that. And that's how I meet people, right? Like I go out in the world, have adventures by myself, and sometimes people strike up a conversation, and sometimes I strike up a conversation. The amount of times and the amount of friends I've made here in like the last week and a half where I just – I'm at the beach and I'm holding a football, and someone goes, hey, you want to play catch? I'm like, yeah, let's throw a football back and forth. I'm at the bar, and, and there's a guy next to me, and he's like, eh, what are you drinking? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, it's a lava flow. It's, it's a – Pina colada with strawberry. 
it's really fruity but really good and I, you know like i've made a lot of friends that way at the at the beach just hanging out hey man your shades are cool hey awesome where'd you get them costco oh the costco has sunglasses yeah they do they're the best like it just leads to conversations don't be afraid to speak up and also don't be afraid of getting rejected if you want to make friends not everybody's going to want to be your friend sometimes you're nice to somebody and they don't want anything to do with you they're like they're like frankly screw off i don't want to talk about my sandals i don't care that they look cool like have a good like you know just, they're not happy to talk to you and that's fine not everybody is but sometimes you meet people that are and i have got a lot of instagram followers from that and made a lot of friends just by not being afraid to open my mouth and give a compliment or ask a question or and also here's the thing when you reach out to someone you don't know you're like hey I, your sunglasses are cool where'd you get them or hey what are you reading like right you ask them a question if they're mean to you or don't want to talk to you it's okay because you're never going to see them again but but uh, the other day we were at uh at a restaurant me and my dad and uh my stepmom and the server was really, really nice and having a good time. And she's like, Hey, you know, her boyfriend came up and she's like, yeah, my boyfriend loves sports. And she said, Oh, huh. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I talk about sports for a living and it came up. We had a good time. And I, I remember I'm looking at this angle cause I was talking to her this angle and her boyfriend followed me on Instagram and we're going to watch a game hopefully during the playoffs. Like that's another potential friend right there. So talk to people and, Push yourself a little bit because you never know how a simple question like what are you reading can lead to you making new friends. And in the last week and a half, I've done that a lot. And uh, it's been awesome. So go be yourself, like yourself, enjoy your own company. And if you're enjoying your own company and having a good time, you tend to attract people that want to talk to you. So uh, guys, that's all I have. I love you. I appreciate you. Hope you have a great day. And uh, I'll see you very shortly for the next episode. But um bum Bam, we are done.